What's so special about Jesus? How would you answer that question? That's the question really being answered in the book of Hebrews where the writer presents the superiority and, uni and the uniqueness of Jesus. May I ask you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, this wonderful passage, because this Good Friday, I want to remind you of this profound truth that the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ on the cross is an unrepeatable sacrifice. It is the ultimate sacrifice. It is the unique sacrifice. It is the perfect sacrifice. And this belief on Jesus dying on the cross for our sins as the perfect sacrifice is central to the message of Easter. Let me read with you, first of all, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. In the Pew Bible, it's page 1006. And every priest, the writer is referring to the Old Testament priests, what we call the Levitical priesthood, the priest in the Old Testament, all coming from the tribe of Levi. So we talk about the Levitical system, the Levitical priests. Every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God. Isn't that a magnificent verse? Verse 12, let me read it again. But when Christ had offered for all time, think of that, for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until His enemies should be made a footstool for His feet. For by a single offering He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The writer is telling us, and he's writing particularly to Hebrews, uh, to Jewish people, some of whom had embraced the Christian faith, some truly embracing it, and some only superficially. He's saying that Christ's sacrifice ends all other sacrifices. The sacrifice of Jesus ends all sacrifices as the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus on the cross is the perfect sacrifice. One of the questions that all of us have to deal with, irrespective of our backgrounds or the uh, religious beliefs we were taught, is this. How do we deal with the sin in our life? Because unless you're terribly deceived, you realize that you're a fallen individual that you can't live up to your own standards, far, far less the standards of God. And so all of us have to deal with this thought, how do I deal with the sin in my life? It's a good question to ask people as you talk to them about their, their beliefs, isn't it? All of us have to deal with sin. Now in the, Levit in the Levitical system in the Old Testament, there was a constant reminder of sin. And the writer is telling us it was impossible for these sacrifices to take away sin. Otherwise, the sacrifices would have stopped. Let me read with you the first four verses of Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 verse 1, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered 
every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, these sacrifices could never make perfect those who draw near. So the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross accomplishes what all of these Old Testament sacrifices could never accomplish. And the writer is saying, now there is no need of these sacrifices because Christ's sacrifice is final. His one perfect sacrifice ends all of the sacrifices. Verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Now here, Christ's sacrifice is contrasted with the Old Testament sacrifices, and I want to mention four sacrifices. And as we contrast the Old Testament sacrifices with the sacrifice of our Lord, I pray that your love for Christ and your understanding of the gospel and your understanding of the Easter message will deepen. First of all, the Old Testament sacrifices were shadows. Christ's sacrifice is the reality. Verse 1, the Old Testament sacrifices, the writer says, were a shadow of the good things to come. The sacrifices ordained by God, they were pointing forward to the perfect sacrifices. They were externals, they were types, they were illustrations, they were shadows. But the writer says, verse 1, they were not the true form of these realities. Christ's sacrifice was the reality, was, to use the language of verse 1, was the true form. It was the answer to all of the Old Testament sacrifices. The Old Testament sacrifices were just the preliminary outline, as it were, but Christ's sacrifice is the finished product. Did any of you ever receive at Christmas, I did as a little boy, painting by numbers? You ever heard of that? And it seemed to be most of them were of ships in the ocean, at least the ones I got. And so you got painting by numbers at Christmas, and here is a scene, and it's divided up into little sections, and each section has a number which corresponds with a color, it was oil paint, uh, in, in my cases, and if it was number two, you look at number two of the, of the oil and you would paint it in. You started with the outline, but as you finished it, there was this beautiful colored picture, the best pictures I ever painted. <laughs> I needed the outline. The point is this. Now that the reality has come, now that the finished product has come, why would you go back to the outline? Let me illustrate it another way. When I first met Goodney, we were separated for several months. She was in the Faroe Islands, I was in Scotland. And to show how old we were, there was no iPhones. Remember these days? <laughs> no internet no cell phones. And before Goodney left, she gave me this beautiful picture of herself. Now, do you think I looked at that picture often when we were separated? Of course I did. I looked at that picture every day of this beautiful Scandinavian little woman. After several months, she very wisely left the Faroe Islands, because she was just crazy about me, and she, <laughs> and she came down to Scotland. And once she was there, I no longer looked at the photo so much. You see, why, why would you look at a photograph when the real person is right in front of you? That's the argument here 
Here is the first contrast. The Old Testament sacrifices were the shadows, were the photos, were the outlines. Ah, but now there is the reality of the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't go back to the shadows. Sometimes people want to go back to the shadows. Don't do that. Here's the second contrast. The Old Testament sacrifices were offered daily. Christ's sacrifice was once and for all. I love that. Do you know this verse one? The Old Testament priests, says the writer, offered the same sacrifices continually every year. Verse 11, every priest stands daily at his service. Every day of his life, the priest sacrificed animal after animal after animal, and it was then a continuous reminder of sin. Some of you take medication daily, don't you? And every time you take that little pill, every time you take that drug, there is a reminder that you have a problem that will not go away, and you've got to take that medication every day of your life. It is, says the writer, verse 3, but in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. In contrast, the writer is saying, verse 10, the sacrifice of our Savior on the cross was once for all. It will never be repeated. And what we're doing at the Lord's table, please understand, is not, is not a re-sacrificing of Christ. This is not an altar. We do not have an altar at Calvary Church. That surprises some people. Some of you come from churches where there is an altar, and you come and you, you look around and, and say, well, is this the altar? No, this is not the altar. You say, well, is the Lord's table the altar? No. The Lord's Supper is served not from an altar, but from a table. The only altar is the cross. That is the one sacrifice which ends all sacrifices. At the Lord's table, we are not re-sacrificing our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, His sacrifice for sins, did you notice what it says? It is for all time. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, I love that. It is a perfect unrepeatable, unique sacrifice. The Old Testament sacrifices were not only offered daily, they were offered repeatedly. The priests, verse 11, were offering repeatedly the same sacrifice over and over again. When one priest died, he was replaced by another. There was seemingly no end to the repetitive ritual of the Levitical priesthood and sacrifices. And the writer is saying in his argument here in chapter 10 that the repetitive nature of the sacrifices demonstrates that the system was inadequate. And by the very virtue of the repetition of the sacrifices, there was a continual reminder of sins. Would these Old Testament sacrifices ever come to an end? Think of the contrast. Verse 14, Christ offered one single sacrifice of Himself. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as we said. And with Christ's death, the Old Testament system of worship, the Old Covenant, comes to an end. Chapter 8, verse 13, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one, the Mosaic Covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. It comes to an end. And so there is generation after generation, year after year, these animals being slaughtered. And now, in the fullness of time, into time and space, 
God sends His perfect Son, the sinless Lord Jesus Christ, and He comes willingly and obediently and offers Himself as the sacrifice. In verses 7 and 9, we read, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. Previously, in the old system, there were unwilling, dumb animals being offered. Ah, but now, with this perfect sacrifice, it's not an animal. It is the sinless Son of God whose whole life was one of obedience and who voluntarily gives Himself in death on the cross for the sins of others, for your redemption and mine. And the cross is the ultimate demonstration of His obedience to His Father's will. This is God's eternal plan for sinners to be saved. Look at verse 9, the end of the verse. It says, He does away with the first… What's the first? The, the Levitical system. He does away with that in order to establish the second, that is the new covenant which is instituted, which is inaugurated with the death of our Savior. Old Testament sacrifices were repetitive. Christ offered one sacrifice for all time. And that one sacrifice perfectly satisfied His Father and His God. Here's the third one. Shadows in contrast to reality, daily in contrast to once for all. Third, the Old Testament sacrifices were offered by priests standing. Christ sat down after His sacrifice for Himself. If you know anything about the Old Testament tabernacle and Solomon's temple, there was no chairs in the tabernacle. There were no chairs in the temple. Oh, there was a table, there was altars. In the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant, there was the mercy seat, but there were no chairs. The Old Testament priests never sat down, symbolizing that their work was never done. Verse 11, every priest stands daily at his service. Notice the emphasis on the word daily offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. There was always another sacrifice to be made. And so they're offering their sacrifices standing after the perfect sacrifice is made. What does the Lord Jesus do? It says, He sat down at the right hand of His Father. Christ sitting down at God's right hand demonstrates that His work, the work of salvation, and how wonderful this is, is completely, finally, and perfectly completed. When Christ, verse 12, had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God. His work is done. He sits down. He does not keep on offering the one sacrifice of Himself. No. His sacrifice is perfect. It never needs to be repeated. It never will be repeated. F. F. Bruce writes, a seated priest is a guarantee of a finished work and an accepted sacrifice. He sits down at the Father's right hand, demonstrating that His Father and His God is perfectly satisfied with the sacrifice of His Son. The right hand is the place of honor, the place of glory, the debt of sin has been completely paid by, by Christ. Yes, the debt of sin that you and I have accumulated has been completely paid by our Lord Jesus, who is now exalted to the Father's right hand. And we see in verse 13 that He is the ruler and the victor of all, waiting from that time until His enemy should be made a footstool for His feet. Yes, on the third day He rises from the dead. No enemy can thwart His perfect work and sacrifices, and all of His enemies will soon be under His feet. He is the victor over all, having accomplished 
the work that the Father sent him to do as he offers himself as a perfect sacrifice. And as we've thought over the last few Sundays, as we looked at Matthew 24 and 25, he's now, as we are waiting that day, when he'll return with power and glory, and all of his enemies will be vanquished, and he'll set up that wonderful, glorious reign. Here's the fourth and the final one, contrast. The Old Testament sacrifices were ineffective, the only covered sin. Christ's sacrifice is efficacious. It takes away sin forever. Old Testament sacrifices only covered sin. Did you notice verse 4? It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, was a yearly reminder to Israel that its sin had to be covered so they could continue to have fellowship with God. If these sacrifices were effective, they would not need to be repeated. And the Israelites, of course, could never enter the Holy of Holies. There was only one man, one time a year, the high priest, who could enter into the Holy of Holies. And now, through the magnificent sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, His sacrifice provides for His people direct access to the very throne room of God. And His sacrifice for our sin provides not a covering, it provides 100% cleansing. Brothers and sisters, allow this truth to grip your hearts. Verse 14, listen to this. Think of it. Think of the power of the cross. We're singing about it. Think of the power of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of the power of His blood. For by a single offering, what's the single offering? His death on the cross. For by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Isn't that wonderful? For all time. And the Holy Spirit, through Jeremiah, bears witness to the covenant God made, that new covenant which is inaugurated by Christ's blood, by Christ's death, as we'll celebrate in a minute. It provides what the old covenant couldn't do. Now God's law, verse 16, is planted in our hearts and our minds, and divine power is given to us to obey God's commands from the heart. With the Old Testament sacrifices, there was a yearly reminder of sin, verse 3. But with our Savior's sacrifice, there is no such reminder of sins. Verse 17, can you grasp this? Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds, what? No more. My brother, my sister, the debt of your sin, I understand it's huge. I understand you consider yourself to be the chiefest of sinners, but that debt of sin has been completely and for all time paid. Never again will God bring that sin before you. Your sins and your lawless deeds, we read, verse 17, He will remember no more. Think of that. Have you ever done something wrong? <clears throat> Perhaps offended your wife or your, your husband or a friend, and, and they say they've forgiven you, but you get into another argument about something and they, they revisit the past. We tend to do that, don't we? Or we, we like to go back and, and dig up the past and, and bring the worst that people have done back to them, to them and shove it in their face, as it were. Isn't that wonderful that God never does that? You say, well, I'm a very unworthy person, John. Yes, you are. In fact, you're more unworthy than you really think you are. You are very unworthy before a holy God. You deserve the condemnation of God. 
But into our world, God sends His Son. And that death is so efficacious that all of your sin for all time and for all eternity has totally gone, and God will never, ever, ever remember your sins again. They have been gone. One hundred percent forgiveness of sins flows from this perfect sacrifice which establishes the new covenant. And your sins, if you're a true follower of Christ, will never, ever be brought before you by God. Not in this life, not in eternity. You need not worry. You need not have guilt or shame about the past. It's covered by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that wonderful, irrepeatable, unforgettable sacrifice of our Savior on the cross that He remembers us no more. Two concluding questions. First, have you received the forgiveness of all your sins? Have you? Perhaps you've been raised in a, a religion where, you, where you've offered sacrifices. Here is the true God, God incarnate, who by the one perfect sacrifice of Himself ends all sacrifice. On the cross, our Savior shouted, finished! The perfect work of salvation has been accomplished by our magnificent Savior. No need now for these sacrifices. They've all gone. A new covenant has now been instituted, instituted by His very blood. And the payment God required because of our sin has been paid in full. I think we're going to sing, Jesus paid it all. That's it. He paid it all, 100% paid. And now you're free. Verse 17, your sins are remembered no more. No more shame, no more guilt, no more remorse. Your sins and iniquity, God says, I will remember no more. Stop going back to your sins. Stop talking about them. Stop digging away at them. They're gone. They're remembered no more. You're now free to live the life with this very law written in your heart to love and to serve God. Here's the second question. What are you depending on to get to heaven? All religions other than authentic Christianity are standing up religions. The work is never done. You've got to keep hoping, keep trying, keep working, keep praying, keep offering, keep lighting a candle, keep going through some ritual. Try harder, be better, be good. Go through this ritual and that ritual. All of the religions of this world are standing up religions. But our Savior, the uniqueness of Jesus is this, that our Savior is seated. The work of salvation is done, perfectly done, once and for all finished. You and I can never add to the work of salvation. It's a masterpiece. It's perfect, accepted by God. Christ seated at the Father's right hand, and now in His amazing grace offers you the salvation and says, the one that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. God's amazing grace is the very basis of our salvation, accomplished through Christ's perfect sacrifice. If you've never done it, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Receive the salvation, and as we break bread, may we from redeemed hearts Say to our Lord Jesus Christ, I love you, that my sins are many, are gone, and are gone forever, and I love you, and I serve you. Our Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. We realize that we're just dabbling, dabbling in the, in the ocean, as it were, as we survey the infinite depth of your love and of your grace.
as we sometimes sing, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. We ask, Father, that you'll help us to understand as we meditate on Christ that we'll love Him more, that we will hate sin, and that we'll never go back to our old sins, but to love and serve our Savior. We ask it in His name. Amen.